Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for doing this. Pleasure to talk to you, Dan. How are you doing? Terrific. In another month, I'll be 95 years old, and I'm doing great. Well, we're going to talk about a lot of things here. I have a lot of ground I want to cover with you, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, how do you do it? Soon to be 95 years old, you're working like a farmer in a clearing all the time. How do you do it? Well, I have a wonderful wife, and I've got a great family. I now have four great grandchildren. When you have little kids around the house, again, it's, it's inspiring because they have so much energy. They're curious about everything. Life is so exciting. And you look at them and you say, what can I do to make the world better? Life is so exciting. Here we are in the middle of the second decade of the 21st century. What excites you? Well, I said my great-grandchildren excite me quite a lot, but I work on I worry about energy and its effect on climate. Energy has security implications, it has economic implications, and it has environmental implications. And I've worked on that. Actually, I started working on that in 1969 when I was Secretary of Labor. Then I'm director of the budget, and the president signs the law creating the EPA. Environmental Protection Agency. Yes, so I helped create the EPA. I think a lot of people have forgotten that during the Nixon administration, the EPA was created during uh, that period. Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. Uh, and actually, a lot of improvement in our atmosphere has come about as a result of what the EPA has done. Mr. Secretary, I want to get back to your journey on climate change. You, you were involved as far back as the very late 1960s and the early 1970s. Was there anything after that that really turned you on to this subject? For example, I heard about a discussion you had with a, I think it was a U.S. Navy admiral, who showed you some video well, about there's, a, there's an admiral named Gary Bruffhead, who retired as chief of naval operations and came here to the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And he started a task force on the Arctic. And he has a video that shows the disappearance of sea ice. And it goes along like this, and then there's a discontinuity. You can see it's accelerating. So we're studying what are the implications of this in terms of the animals there, the fish, uh, the, the life say around. say humans. Yeah, so it's a big thing. And the United States is not by any means stepping up to what we should do. But at any rate, you see the sea ice melting. Why? And it's melting faster and faster because as it melts, the ice which reflects the sun is less of it, and so it accelerates. The ice sheet over Greenland is melting fast. And in the West Ar Antarctica, there are also big sheaths of ice plunging into the sea. So the globe is warming. I don't think there's any question about it. And you can argue about it, but I think the evidence is fairly clear that carbon has something to do with it. You have mentioned that one of the potential dangers of climate change is the creation of new diseases that we can't even imagine now and have no way to deal with. Let's talk about that for a moment. Well, what happens <clears throat> as it gets warmer is the tropical diseases come north, and we're not really prepared for that. We haven't thought about it. But they will come, and the mosquitoes will come, and that's just what happens when it gets warmer up here. So we. This is something that's sort of predictable. You can see it, and we should be prepared for it. Well, you mentioned this is a climate change seeing as a whole. It's an economic problem, and the consequences economically could be worse than a lot of people imagine. It's a health danger in it. There's a military and strategic factor in this. You've talked to a lot of military people. Are they concerned about climate change? Yes, they are. In what context? They consider that it's a source of instability. And instability is something that winds up with conflict. And sometimes it draws you in, or in one way or another, it affects you. Where would you place, in terms of problems of the 21st century, where would you place this on a scale of, of importance? The sea level is rising. It is warmer. And people are noticing it more and more. So there's things beginning to happen, and people want to know, well, okay, what, 
what can we do about this? And one of the problems is, if you wait too long, then it's hard to turn around and go back the other way. Because once the carbon gets in the atmosphere, it stays there. So you have to be careful about this. I'm absorbing that, and one of the thoughts in my mind is this. There are gonna be plenty of people who say, well, yes, this, the seas rise and the climate changes, but all this is part of the natural progression. It's not anything really new, and it's not a real and present danger. To those people, you say what? Well, I say, take a note out of Ronald Reagan's playbook. Remember the Montreal Protocol. That's the one dealing with the ozone. Where there were scientists on both sides of the issue, but they all agreed that the consequences would be severe if it happened. In the mid-80s, I'm Secretary of State, and we get information that a lot of top scientists think the ozone layer is depleting. So Ronald Reagan was convinced that it was a problem. And instead of doing what we now do, which is vilify the people who disagree with you, he put his arm around them and said, okay, you don't have the same opinion, but you agree that it would be a catastrophe, so how about taking out an insurance policy? So that got people off our back. And as often happens when there's a serious objective, the creative juices in America turn on the science and engineering. In this case, the DuPont Company came up with something you could do, not aspire to, do today. You don't govern by vilifying everybody who's against you. You govern by looking for a way you can find some common ground. And nobody does that today. Why do you think that is? I think there's too much campaigning. Campaigning is an act of division. You campaign to say, I'm better than you, so vote for me. Divide, divide, divide. And that's what people do all the time, they campaign. Governing is the exact opposite of campaigning. Government says, let's find some areas where we agree, where we can do something together. You have said, and I'll quote you directly here, good work on conservation and the environment is in the Republican gene. And you pointed, as you have in this interview with uh, President Nixon's creation of the EPA, President Reagan taking on the problem of uh, the depletion of the ozone. President Bush, 41, did the acid rain. Yes. Teddy Roosevelt used to wave the flag around. He was our first big environmentalist, a Republican. Yeah. Good point. It, the first President Bush dealt with acid rain. That was about 1990, to my recollection. And for that matter, uh, that uh, President George W. Bush acknowledged that uh, climate change was a problem, so we had to deal with it. But where I was going with this is what's happened. Now, if you watch the debates for among the presidential candidates, science in general is very seldom mentioned in any way, and climate change is not even discussed. Why is that? I don't know. People will get mugged by reality. So I, I tell them all, I say, be careful of the words you use. You're going to get mugged by reality. Do you talk to any of these people on any basis at any time and say, listen, uh, I think you're making a mistake or I think you're wrong about this? Well, anybody that wants to talk to me, I talk to them, but they don't come around very much. <laughs> In some cases, there's real hostility to the whole idea of climate change. I mean, there are some people who are skeptical, but then there's some people who have genuine hostility to it. Why is that? Well, I think there are people who are hostile to the campaign about it. And there are some people who are over the top advocates, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and they stimulate a reverse kind of attitude. Sooner or later, common sense and what you observe around you prevails. Well, can't resist asking you, based on your, by any objective analysis, tremendous life of public service. Marine Corps serving in a high place in the Eisenhower administration, Nixon administration, Reagan administration, to the next incoming president, whether he or she be Democrat, Republican, or independent, about climate change, you'd advise doing what? Well, first of all, you need to see that we have adequate R&D support, which we do, and it could be more than it is now, but it doesn't have to be a lot. Sustained 
adequate support for energy R&D. The cost of solar has gone down precipitously, and so on and so on. We're going to have large-scale storage of electricity pretty soon. So a lot's being accomplished. So keep that going. In the federal budget, the amount being devoted, you can't even find it in the rounding error. So it isn't that big. Then we need to say, if carbon is the problem, let's put a tax on it. I think we should have a carbon tax that is revenue neutral. And get away from a lot of these things where the government is telling you, do this, do this, do this. Just put a price out there and let the market work. And the market will sort out what the best ways to go about things are. I want to make sure that uh, the viewers and listeners can understand this, that what you do is you go to the gas station and there's an additional cost to the gas or you put natural gas in your home and there's an additional cost to that. But if you're able to reduce the amount of carbon-causing uh, fuel, then everybody gets a check. They get a carbon dividend. Right. And since everybody gets the same amount, it's basically progressive. In other words, a greater percentage for people without wealth than it is for those with wealth. So it's just distributed on a per-person basis. Well, what about the argument, Mr. Secretary? And you hear it from not just Republicans, but some independents, and for that matter, at least uh, a few or more Democrats who say, oh, wait a minute, here's George Schultz talking about a tax increase. He's talking about raising taxes. Well, I'm sorry. A tax is something that collects money. My proposal does not collect any money. It takes money in and then it puts it back out again. For instance, you could have it go into a fund administered by the Social Security system. Visible fund, every day you can know how much is in it. And periodically when it gets to enough, you pay it out either to all the people collecting Social Security benefits or all the people either paying in or collecting. So the money goes out to individuals. Mr. Secretary, at one level, you and I have known each other for quite a long time. And well, you you're a very, just, very famous guy. <laughs> well, not nearly as accomplished or famous as you, but you have a reputation for being candid and a straight talker. I can hear a number of people saying, listen, I respect Secretary Schultz. He's a great man, and he knows what he's talking about. But I'm more likely to become the Pope of Rome than we are to put forward and actually activate the plan that you have put out. What are the chances, realistically, of that ever happening? Well, first of all, the energy R&D is something that's going on right now. And there is money going into it. I organized a little seminar here, and I got 12 MIT scientists to come and had the same number here. We spent two days talking about what we call game changers. Then we did the same thing. We went to MIT and we had the similar thing. Then we took the act to Washington. And John Boehner set us up with the Republicans on the House Energy Committee. And he stayed for the entire time. Selling those people energy R&D was a piece of cake. No problem. As soon as you say, OK, now here's this great idea. Let's have the government go into business with it. You lose everybody, including me. So let the R&D develop things and let the D go to the point where you've demonstrated operability and scalability and let the market take over. That'll work, and you'll get support for that. I want to go back to something, Mr. Secretary, about uh, those who are skeptical that we can do very much about climate change, to say nothing of those who are skeptical about the whole concept of climate change. One argument goes this way. Look, we're just one country in a great big global environment. And there's not a whole lot we can do because China, which is growing, exploding with growth, uses coal, even more coal than we know, and you can't get China to agree to anything significant. So these people are of a mood and mind, and one can understand it, just throwing up their hands saying, listen, you're never going to get places like China and India to go along with any of these things. So we just should get it and move on. Well, a lot of people feel that way. They're acknowledging the problem, but sort of say there's nothing you can do about it. I think history teaches differently. I was just in China last week. And if there's any place that's conscious 
of the problems that come out of the use of energy, it's China, because the cities, the air is so foul, it's a health problem. It's affecting how long people live. It's very visible. You don't have to sell them on the idea that there's a problem. What you have to do is get them to do things. And I think it would be a lot of appeal if we went and said, and I'm, I'm a believer, that it's what you do, not what you aspire to by 2050. What are you gonna do today? There are a lot of things you can do today. And we ought to get together with them and go over all the, have, have a little deal that gets rid of the intellectual property issues. And then figure out things that are possible to do today and start doing them. And they'll make a difference. There's no other country around now that can give leadership. We have to give it. We can. And it isn't that, it isn't that hard and not that expensive. You can do it. Ronald Reagan established himself as a leader in his period. In the earlier periods, we had Eisenhower, we had Marshall, following President Truman. And a lot was accomplished almost steadily throughout. President Carter did the Camp David Accords that were magnificent. And all contributions were made continuously. So now we have to say to ourselves, the world needs leadership, so let's give it. What about the argument that, well, even if China cooperates, they're not gonna cooperate fully and we will be at an economic disadvantage if we make these moves trying to reduce climate change as best we can but China is moving but well behind, there'll be at such an economic advantage that we'll lose jobs and our economy will take a big hit. You're an economist by training. Well, here's what we should do. Any country that sends us goods that doesn't deal with this problem will have the carbon tax applied to their imports. So we'll, in effect, we'll sort of try to apply it all over the world as a result of that and get people's attention. I, I take your point saying, listen, you're, you're not dealing with the problem of climate change, so on your imports, we're gonna put a tax. Right. Is yeah, that practical? Yes, of course it's practical. I could sell that. You'll buy it, wouldn't you? Yes. No, well, you're tough. I can sell it to you. But I can I'm sell an easy anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, Secretary, you've been very generous with your time and with your knowledge. What question have I not asked you that I should have asked you? Well, you didn't really ask me much about my great-grandchildren. And they're the ones who, are, they're the future. And my, I have 11 grandchildren, they're doing great too. The last one will graduate from this college, the college in June, so they'll all be college graduates. And they're all interesting young people and they're doing different things. So that's where my life is centered now, watching them. Do they ever talk to you about climate change and what you think about it? Oh yeah, they're all, the young people you'll find are worried about it. Guys like you and I won't be affected very much. Or maybe me, you're still a young man by my standards. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been called a young man, I can tell you that. Well, when I was asked to speak at Henry Ber Kissinger's 90th birthday party, I said, Henry, from my standpoint of 92 years, you're a promising young man. <laughs> Brought the house down. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Great thank to you, have you very, here. very much.